United program, created by Rio Grande. Seattle Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 301 regarding a murder. Assist the Bremerton and Kipsis County officers. And that's all. Rose and Quinn. <laughs> appointment to His Majesty the King. The right to advertise that declaration is a most coveted honor with every business concern in Great Britain. It establishes the outstanding quality of a product in the eyes of all British subjects, for it to have been chosen by their monarch. Here at home, an equally high distinction is enjoyed by serving the most discerning users of gasoline and thus earning the tribute first in public service. As the sensational motor fuel chosen by those who know the most about gasoline, the motor fuel that provides more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other public serving equipment with a performance that is equal to every emergency. All purpose Rio Grande crack deserves that title. Drive into the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood in the morning and let one tank full convince you, as it has thousands of others, that the new Rio Grande crack is the all purpose gasoline that makes every car do everything better. Rio Grande crack. The most highly recommended gasoline sold in the West. The motor fuel that is first in public service. The facts around which tonight's story has been built were taken from the confidential files of the Seattle, Washington Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief of Police William N. Sears to prepare a foreword to our program. Crimes without motive are the hardest of all crimes to solve. Where robbery is the motive, it might be said that so far as police work is concerned, motive is lacking. The man who kills as a result of this sort of crime is usually a methodical, hard, cold, cruel, and careful man, one who leaves little trace of his identity, such as the type of man with whom our story tonight deals. But as bare of identifying clues as this case was, it proved a potent example of the inevitable end of a life of crime. It proves that no matter how careful the criminal is in concealing his identity, sooner or later he will be brought to justice and will be made to pay for his crime. On the afternoon of July 13th, 1933, two men entered the reception room of a doctor whose offices were located in the downtown section of Seattle, Washington. You watch out here, Blackie, while well, I go into the doc's private office and operate on him. Hadn't I better come with you? No, I can take care of this job by myself, whatever you say, Leo. Oh, I didn't know there was anyone out here in the reception room. My nurse is gone for the yeah, day. Yeah, we know all that. Now get back uh, in that office. Uh, but I don't understand. Just what... You heard what I said. Get uh, back in there. What, that hammer. What are you going to do with that hammer? We'll find out. What? I'll oh, just close this door so as we won't disturb anybody. <laughs> and now, Doc, you're going to get yours. Uh, why are you doing this to me? Shut up. That the doctor was not killed, but the savage beating he received from the hammer wielded by his assailant was no fault of his would-be murderers. Four months later, on the evening of November 20th, 1933, Sam Heaslip, a special investigator for Governor Meyer of the state of Oregon, was returning to his home in Portland. Just a minute there, fella. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Are you Sam Heaslip? Yeah. Why? Been doing some snooping around for the governor, haven't you? Oh, what business is that of yours? Just this, wise guy. Twice, the deadly hand had struck, this time fatally and still there remained no clue as to the identity of the brutal killer. For this was only the beginning. As darkness closed down on the little resort of Erland's Point near Bremerton, Washington, on the night of March 31st, 1934, the howling of three dogs cooped up in a parked sedan became increasingly annoying to the residents. Two of them, K.A. Erland, pioneer settler and founder of the point, and his nephew, Tom Saunders, decided to investigate. You know, it gives me the creep to listen to that howling. Oh, the poor devils. They've been shut up in that car for three days. Yes, I know. It's a darn shame to treat animals that way. I can't understand the Catherine Familia. Now, that car belongs to friends of theirs who are apparently staying with them. I don't know, but I can't stand that howling much longer. Let's try to let those dogs out for 
a run. Oh, yes. Uh, maybe they'll be quiet then. Did you bring your flashlight with you? Yep, I got it right here. I'll flash it in the car. Huh. Three of them. And just frantic to get out. The doors all seem to be locked. Yeah. Looks like we're going to have to leave them in there. Well, let's go up to the Claflin's house. If anybody's home, we'll get them to let the dogs out. Otherwise, nobody in the point here will be able to sleep tonight. Okay. Doesn't look much like anybody's home, though. No lights on anywhere. The place is black as pitch. Well, we'll try anyway. The doors to the garage are open and Claflin's car's in there all right. Maybe they're not out. You'd think they'd have a fire going on a cold night like this. But I don't see any smoke coming from the chimney. We'll try the back door here. That's a good idea. If they're asleep, they can hear us better back here. Mr. Claflin. Mr. Claflin. No, no, they don't seem to be home. I can't imagine people being so selfish as to go away and leave dogs locked up like that. Let me have that flashlight a minute, will you, please? Yeah, sure. This thing has got me curious. I'm going to flash it into that window there. What for? If there's nobody home, it won't do any good to... My Lord. Come here. Quick. Huh? What is it? Look. Down there. On the floor. Why, it's... It's a man lying there. But his face. Look at his face. Good Lord, Tom. He's... He's dead. That battered face. Turn off the light, Tom. I don't want to look anymore. What will we do? Do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get out of here and call the sheriff. Within a few minutes after Erland's tumbled words came to him over the telephone wires, Sheriff D.L. Blankenship of Kitsap County was on his way from Bemerton to the scene of the ghastly discovery. With him was his brother, Under Sheriff Rush Blankenship. With the arrival of the two officers, a storm that had been impending suddenly broke, and rain came down in torrents. I'm afraid this rain's going to play havoc with any footprints that might be around. Uh-huh. Is this the window you shine the light through? Yes, that's the one. Well, we'll have a look. Uh-huh, yeah, I see. And there, look over there. Where? Over to that corner. That's the body of a woman. She's sprawled partly on the floor, with one arm flung across a daybed. Good Lord, two of them. Come on, let's get in there. Oh, it's locked. Well, we'll fix that. <coughs> Jump in, Jupiter. Look at the condition of this kitchen. It looks like there's been a fight in here, sure enough. That's no lie. The place is a wreck. Broken bottles, dishes, smashed cans of food all over the place. Not only that... There's blood smeared over the floor and along the walls. My huh? nerves are jumpy as a racing colt. I think the light switch is just to the left of the door. Thanks. Well, it looks like murder, all right. Look there. Man's wrists are tied in front of him with a strip of cloth. Both of them were gagged, and the woman has a blindfold over her eyes. Well, looks like she tried to get free. The blindfold's been pulled loose quite a bit. Well, whoever did this walked in on them while they were having a little game of poker. See, the cards and poker chips are still on the table between them. Well, it's a funny thing that table wasn't knocked over. Everything else we've seen in this house has been. There's poker hands lying there just as they were dealt. That's so. But here, see here, four hands were dealt out. So more than those two must have been played. Where do you suppose Mr. and Mrs. Claflin are, Sheriff? Well, aren't these Mr. and Mrs. Claflin? No, no they're, they're not, Rush. I knew that myself. At least I know who the woman is. She's Sally Dupree. She lives in Bremerton. The man's name is Gordon Wheeler. He lives right next door here takes care of the Clapton's place when they're away. Wheeler, huh? Well, somebody must have been pretty mad at him. You see, he was shot right between the eyes. Must have killed him instantly. But just the same, his face has been all battered up. Looks like the girl was shot twice. Yeah? One through the neck and the other bullet went right down through the top of her head. Gee. Killer must have been standing right over her. Well, I can't understand who'd want to kill Sally Dupree. She and her husband are show people. They own those dogs outside. Use them in their act. I wonder where her husband is now. I don't know, and I'm beginning to wonder where the Claflins are, too. You don't suppose they, they killed these two and then beat us somewhere, do you, Sheriff? I don't suppose anything yet. I say, let's take a look at the rest of the house. Uh, what's the next room down the hall here? I believe the bathroom comes next. The bathroom? Hmm? Well, this bathroom's a mess, too. Blood all over the floor and on the towels. Now, what's that door at the end of the hall? The Claflins' room. Yeah, well, let's have a look in there, too. Yeah, maybe we can find a motive for this thing. Great Scott. What is it, sir? Another one. Look, that woman lying there on the bed. Where? It's Mrs. Clapton. And the same thing, hands bound in front of her, a gag across her nose and mouth, and her eyes covered, too, with a wide piece of adhesive tape. But she hasn't been shot, Sheriff. Huh? Not here. This killing was done with a knife. 
A deep chest wound and a throat cut, too. This beats me. I say, here's two knives lying on this table. Both of them wiped clean. Sheriff! Yes, what is it? There, sticking out of the closet door. A man's leg! Well, another victim. Say, how long is this going to go on? Here, help me pull some of these dresses off that are piled on top of him. Maybe we can identify him. Right. Hands tied behind him. Throat cut, head battered in. Looks like his jaw's broken in a dozen places. Somebody's going crazy to do a thing like this. The most horrible thing I've ever seen or heard about. You're right on that. I know this fellow, too. He's Paul Harvey, a close friend of the Dupree's. You mean Paul Harvey, the bartender over at that Bremerton night spot? That's right. Hey, let's get away from here for a moment while we collect our thoughts. Uh, the living room is just across the hall there. All right. Let's go in there and see if we can reason this business out. What do you suppose is the motive, Sheriff? Uh, it looks like revenge murder, but it's too early to say yet. Maybe after we've looked around a little more, we can... Good Lord, look there. Now, this is too much. Wait, Scott, Sheriff. This is mass murder. Where the... The man lying by the door there. It's Bert Claflin. Claflin, eh? And the man across the room is Arnold Dupree. Both of them beaten to death. Hey, look, Sheriff. Yeah? Dupree still has the leg of a broken footstool in his hand. That means he put up a fight with the killer. Well, that's more than can be said for poor Claflin. His hands are tied behind him like the other man's. Dupree's hands had been tied, too, but he managed to get them loose somehow. Well, one thing is certain. Whoever did this couldn't have gotten out of here without some kind of injury. The scene in the kitchen, the splintered chairs here in the front room prove there must have been a terrific battle. That's right, Sheriff. The murderer or murderers are cinched to have gotten bruised or cut up. Might even have a bullet wound. Now we've got to send out a general alarm right away. The killer's had more than enough time to get clear of here. Mr. Erland said those dogs have been in that car for three days. Well, that means this must have happened three nights ago. Exactly. We've got to tip off all the hospitals and police agencies to be on the lookout for any injured parties who can't give a good account of themselves. You're going to call in, Sheriff? No, I'm going into Bremerton personally. You stay here and look after things, right? <laughs> Easter Sunday, the day following the gruesome discovery of the sextuple murder, Captain Ernie Yoris, head of the Seattle Homicide Squad in O.K. Bodia, Chief Criminal Deputy Sheriff of King County, and Deputy Fred Frankie conducted a joint investigation at the Claflin home. Room by room, the house was gone over for every sign of physical evidence. Well, I think we're beginning to get a little something tangible to work on, boys. Yes, but there's still a lot of cockeyed angles to this thing, Yoris. Sure, but then you can't expect everything to dovetail at the very first crack. What do you say, Frankie? Let's sum this business up and see where we stand. First, the kitchen. We know there was a battle royal there. Men struggling for their lives. You said it. Everything that wasn't nailed down was either thrown or smashed up in some way. Well, we've got several pieces from broken beer bottles here. Each one with scraps of scalp and hair clinging to them. Scraps of scalp and hair that don't belong to any of the victims. Mm. So must belong to the killer. Right. And there's that bullet that was fired toward the back door. Mm. The one we found embedded in the upper part of the door jamb. Was that a wild shot, or did somebody escape from the killer and run out the back way? Well, it's going to be hard to say. There wasn't any blood outside there, so if anyone did go out that way, they weren't hit. Till if someone had gotten away, they'd have made a report to the police, wouldn't they? Mm, unless the someone who got away was an accomplice, you? Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. Maybe not. However, that wild shot was the same type of bullet as the one that finished Mrs. Dupree. That card room is what puzzles me. Right. Why did he stop and fix it up before he fled? Uh, murderer, I mean. Assuming that he did. Well, we know that the killer cleaned up in the bathroom before leaving. Possibly dressed his wounds, too. Yes, it, it must have been him. Well, yeah, because at that time, the others in the house were all dead. What about those knives we found in the bedroom? They weren't the killers, that's sure. No, they weren't the killers, Bodia. He probably picked them up in the kitchen. Yeah. He wouldn't leave a weapon of his own here. Too much chance that it would identify him. He was smart enough for that, all right, because he took his gun away with him. Anyway, we can't find it. Too bad, too. That'd be a big help. What about that uh, leather thong Claflin's hands were tied with, Frankie? Hmm? I didn't find anything around here it might have come from. Well, it looks to me as if it might have come from a pair of high-top boots. Maybe the killer's own boots. If that's the case, we might start looking for a lumberjack. Uh -huh. There's a lot of logging camps around here. It's worth a try, anyway. Well, here's something else that puzzles me. The killer, we know, brought a gun with him. Then why didn't he use it on all his victims? Why use a knife, too? Chances are he had no more bullets after he'd emptied the cylinder. Uh, after that, he fought with, well, whatever he could lay his hands on. Well, that would explain why he used the hammer on Claflin and Dupree. Yes, it would. And you see here, all these indentations of the head of the hammer on the footstool that Dupree was using to fight with when he died. Yeah. 
So that proves he used it as a shield against the killer's blows. Well, the more I think about it, the more it looks like the work of one man. Two or more men aren't likely to go berserk at the same time. I'm inclined to agree with that. The coroner said that a good deal of the mutilation of the bodies was done after the people were dead. The killer must have gone clean off his nuts. Yeah. A knife wound in the breast killed Mrs. Claffin. Yet the fiend cut her throat and smashed her skull afterwards. And the same thing goes to the bartender, Paul Harvey. Yes. And a knife wound in the back of the neck finished Bert Claflin. The killer wasn't satisfied with that either. And look at poor Dupree. Twenty-one hammer holes smashed through his skull. This is the work of one man, all right. You'll never find two pulling a stunt like this. Still, how could one man bind up six people? Eh? Huh. Well, I don't know. Now, here's something else. What do you boys make of the heel from a woman's shoe that I found in the backyard? And that blood-stained ring of Gordon Wheeler's that I found near it? Do you suppose that broken heel means there's a woman mixed up in the case somewhere? A woman we don't know about? I doubt it. Somehow I can't picture a woman having anything to do with a mess like this. Well, Cherche La Femme, there must be some explanation for that heel. I suppose there is, but what? Oh, who's that coming in? Oh, who's that coming in? Chief Kibble, Pemberton Police. Oh. Hello, Chief. Hello, boys. Find uh, anything yet? Yeah, a little, but not much. I hear something that might help. I just talked to a fellow who says he saw a man he knows going over on the morning boat to Seattle day before yesterday. He said the fellow was all bandaged up. All bandaged up, eh? Yeah. Uh, who was the man you talked to, Kibble? He's a Navy Yard worker. A fellow by the name of Travers. Joe Travers. Did Joe know the name of this fellow he saw? Uh, he said he thought it was something it was Leo, something or other. Didn't remember the last name, huh? No, he said he doesn't know the fellow very well, but when he saw him bandaged up like that, he just thought he'd ask him what had happened. And what did this Leo something or other say? <laughs> he said he'd gotten into a fight in some beer joint. I see. Well, boys, I'm shoving off. Well, what's your hurry? Where are you going, buddy? Uh, I'm going to see this fellow, Joe Trevor, get him to give us a description of his bandaged friend and... And I'm going to send that description all over the coast. Well, do as you like, but the chances are the man got hurt just as he said he did in the beer joint brawl. Maybe he did and maybe he didn't. But if I can find him, he's going to have a lot of tall explaining to do. Okay, then I think we'll get a lot farther with the fingerprints we pick up here. That's just it, boys. It's the worst trouble of all. There isn't a fingerprint in the house that doesn't belong to one of the victims. Nope. What's that? How do you know, Frankie? Because I haven't found any, for one thing. Oh. The others, if you'll notice some of the crimson smears on the wall, both in here and in the bedroom, you'll see what I mean. You mean like the smears by the door here? That's right. Well, what does it mean? It means that whoever made them wore gloves. None of the victims wore gloves. So draw your own conclusion. <laughs> Six months went by. A year, and still no trace of the killer. Although police of Bremerton and Seattle continued their feverish search for the fiend, every lead drew them into a blind alley. Arrests were made, but investigation soon cleared the suspects, and they were released. Through it all, Chief Deputy Bodia persisted in attaching significance to the name Leo, the name of the bandaged man who had been seen on the boat. And then, late one evening in September of 1935, a matron in the Seattle County Jail came to Bodia's office. May I speak with you a minute, Mr. Bodia? Oh, of course. One of my prisoners has been making a terrible fuss nearly every night. I don't know what to do with her. A fuss? What kind of a fuss? Well, she seems to have nightmares. Talks wildly in her sleep. Even screams. She's doing it now. That's odd. Let's go in there. Oh, I wish you would. She has me worried. Say, Al, mm -hmm. I'm going to the jail for a few minutes. I'll be right back. Okay. Come along. No, 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 see? It's like I told you. I can't understand a word. What's she talking no. about? Wait a minute. You'll see what I mean. Oh, Leo. Leo, don't! Leo, don't! There, you see? Who is she? Betty Hodges. She's in here because her husband was mixed up in some kind of burglary. They're going to accuse her of receiving some of the stolen goods. Uh-huh. Well, now listen carefully. There's something I want you to do for me. Yes? Keep that woman by herself. Listen to everything she says during the nightmares and keep track of it. Above all, don't let her know that she's talking in her sleep. Yes, sir. I'll get in touch with you from time to time. Seattle Police Department. Get uh, Detective. 
Detective Richard Mahoney on the wire for me, if he's there, will you please? Mahoney speaking. Say, Dick, this is Bodie up at the sheriff's office. Yeah? What's on your mind? I just learned you were in charge of the case against Betty and Cecil Hodges. Uh, yeah, that's right. Do you know if either one of them knows a man named Leo? Leo? Leo who? Well, I don't know his last name. Well, I wouldn't know. Well, say, wait a minute. Uh, come to think of it, Hodges did mention somebody by that name. Good. In what way? I mean, uh, what was it in reference to? Hodges has been trying to spring his wife from jail. Says she has nothing to do with the rap against him. Yeah? Well, he wants to make a deal with me. Says if I see that the charges against her are dropped, he'll give me a hot tip on the slugging of that doctor and the uh, shooting of Sam Eastlip down in Portland. He will, eh? Yeah, well, that's what he says. I haven't paid much attention to it. That's an old gag with some of these birds, you know. Well, uh, where does the name Leo fit into this? Well, Hodges let it slip out once while he was trying to swap his information for his wife's release. Listen, Mahoney, I'm certain we've run onto something hot. Come on over here to the jail. We're going to talk turkey to your prisoner tonight. Guys, give me your word you'll kill that bum rap against my wife. If what you have to say is on the up and up and worth it, we'll play ball with you. Okay. Well, I knocked the name of the bird who slugged that dot and bumped off Sam Heaslip. Now, out of this bird? His name's Leo Hall. How do we know you're giving us a right steer? Because Leo wanted me and the Heaslip join with him. I went to Portland and looked over the layout. I didn't want nothing to do with it. Why not? I don't want nothing to do with murder. I'd at least make a move to keep Leo from getting sore. Now, how do we know you went to Portland for Leo? Give me a piece of paper and a pencil, and I'll draw you the layout of Heaslip's apartment. All right. Here you are. Thanks. The door here. Table over here. Yeah. George, that's right. Okay, Hodges. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, but that's not all you're going to tell us about Leo, is it, Hodges? What do you mean? Don't you think you'd better tell us uh, what Leo Hall knows about that mass murder over at Erland's Point, too? How'd you know about that? Didn't uh, anybody ever tell you it's a cop's business to know things? I ain't saying nothing about that. You watch your wife sprung, don't you, Hodges? But you guys said you'd spring her if I told you what I knew about the other John. Yeah, we said we'd turn her loose if you told us all we wanted to know. Okay, okay. Yeah, Leo pulled that one, too. How do you know? My wife was with him that night. Oh. But she didn't have nothing to do with the killings. Leo forced her to go along with him. You mean she was with him in that house while he was murdering all those people? Not all the time. After he killed Mrs. Claflin, the bartender, she ran out the back way. She couldn't stand no more. And Leo just let her go, didn't try to stop her? Sure, he tried to stop her. He even fired his revolver at her when she was going out the back door. Yeah, all this sounds kind of fishy to me. What about you, Bodia? Well, I'm not so sure. We found a bullet embedded in the jam of the rear door, or someone had fired in that direction. Sort of bears out this fellow's story. I told you all I know. No. Well, what about my wife? All right. We'll see if she's released. At least on the wrap they're holding her for now. Thanks. But we can't guarantee she won't be thrown right back in again in connection with the case you just told us about. With the killer's full name in their possession, Bodie and Mahoney soon found others who knew him. Miss Elsa Martin, when asked if she had seen Hall around March of 1934, replied... Why, yes. That must have been around the time he was hurt in the automobile accident. Then Dr. W.H. McFarland was located and questioned. And your records show that you treated Leo Hall for cuts about the head on March 29th of last year, Doctor? Yes, yes, here they are. I found it necessary to take 24 stitches in his scalp. Ah, that makes it just two days before the murders were discovered. I suppose Hall offered some sort of explanation for his wounds. Oh, yes, yes. He said he was parked in a car with some woman and the police came by and beat him up. Huh. Well... Wasn't a story like that a little surprising to you? Not particularly. I knew Leo was always getting into scrapes. Where'd you first meet Hall, Doctor? At an ice skating rink where I sometimes go. He did a great deal of skating. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor, for your information. Uh, not, not at all. Not at all. Good day, Jack. Good day. As far as I'm concerned, that clinches it, Mahoney. Well, the guy sure got his stories mixed. He tells the fellow on the boat he got hurt in a beer parlor brawl. And he tells the girl he was in an automobile accident. And he winds up by telling the doctor he was beaten up by cops. And Leo Hall hung out around ice skating rinks, eh? Well, well, what's so odd in that? That leather thong that was tied around Claflin's wrists. Just as like as not, that thong could have been a shoestring from an ice skate. George, that's right. Well... Well, what's on the menu now? First, we send out word across the country to arrest Leo Hall and haul him for us. Then we have a nice little heart-to-heart talk with Betty Hodges. When 
When approached by the officers, Betty Hodges was obviously terrified and refused to make a statement, not at least while Leo Hall remained at liberty. But on October 24th, word came from Portland, Oregon, that Hall had been arrested there and was being held. Armed with this latest development, Bodia and Mahoney again confronted the girl. Don't you think you'd better tell us what you know about this case, Betty? No. No, I'm afraid to. Afraid of Leo Hall? Yeah. There's no reason for you to be. Hall was arrested in Portland this morning. Arrested? Yes. If you take my advice, you'll talk before he does. How do I know you're not lying to me? Well, here's the wire from the Portland police. Want to see it? Yeah. There you are. Oh. Now, will you talk, Betty? I don't know. Maybe I can help you to make up your mind. I've got the heel you lost when you left the Claflin house on the night of the murder. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you want to know? When did you first meet Hall? I mean, just before you went to the Claflin home with him. On March 28th. I met him downtown. You see, he's a friend of my husband's as well as mine. Go on. Well, we got to talking about parties. And I told him about a party I'd been on at the Claflin's at Bremerton and how they were very wealthy and gave swell parties. What did he say to that? Well, he said that gave him a swell idea that we were going to Bremerton right away. When I asked him why, he said maybe to rob the Claflin's. What? Gee, I, I thought he was only kidding. Yeah, some joke. What happened then? Oh, then he went and got a sack that had a gun and a blackjack and some rolls of adhesive tape in it. I got kind of scared then, and I asked him again what he was going to do. And he still said he was going to rob the Claflin? Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to talk him out of it, but he forced me to go with him. Said he'd kill me if I didn't. So, of course, you went. Sure. Yeah, well, what happened after you got into the house? Everybody but Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Dupree were sitting in a little back room playing cards. Where were Wheeler and Dupree? They'd gone off after some beer. Leo walked into the room first, and I followed him. All right, folks, this is a hold-up. Shut up, all of you. All right, Betty, tape them up like I told you. Hey, who's that? That's Sally's husband and Mr. Wheeler coming back with the beer. Oh, please don't hurt them. Okay, Gordon, just leave the case on the floor. I'll put it on ice in a few minutes. Come along in the other room. All right, you two line up by the wall. What's this? Tape up these two mugs, Betty. Well, what's the meaning? Shut up. I'll get to you guys later. Take the rings off the women, Betty. Oh, oh, don't tear them off. Here, I'll I'll take them off myself. Okay, let her take them off. I feel rather ill. Do you mind if I go to my room and lie down? Yeah, I suppose not. I'll go with you, so don't try anything funny. Oh, I never thought you'd do anything like this to me, Betty Hodges. Oh, gee. Oh, so you recognize it, do you? It's just going to be too bad for you. All of you. Leo. Leo, what are you going to do? You'll see, babe. Leo! Don't, Leo, don't! Just wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. Leo, I'm leaving. I can't stand Come back here, do you hear me? Come back. Oh, no. Come back, you little fool, or I'll shoot. So I, I ran for miles, I guess. It, it was horrible. Yes, I can well imagine it was. That's when I broke off my heel, I suppose. Right after Leo took that shot at me. What? Oh, it scares me just thinking about it. Unless I'm very much mistaken, it's his turn to be scared now. And he finds out what the state of Washington does with their mad dogs. In just a moment, we shall hear the concluding facts regarding our program. In talking to your friends about all-purpose Rio Grande cracks, emphasize that this sensationally performing motor fuel is an exact blend of six power-developing ingredients as compared with the three found in most ordinary gasoline. Keep your gas tank filled with all-purpose Rio Grande cracked, the gasoline that is first in public service. Leo Hall was tried in Portland, convicted and hanged. Betty Hodges was acquitted since it was impossible to prove her acquiescence in the case. Hall's story is another conclusive proof of the losing nature of crime. Seattle police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 301 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case was hanged. That's all. Rose and quit.
your narrator, Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present Murder in the Morning. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.